Hello, everyone. Welcome again to another installment of our Webinar Wednesday. I, my name is Joe O'Donnell. I'm the Senior uh, Technical Engineer and Instructor at Terrapin Technology Group. And welcome to our Webinar Wednesday. Uh, with me, as usual, is our glorious uh, Betty Nelson, who's joining us, uh, as well as uh, our guest speaker, again, uh, with a lot of a plethora of information today on office moves, which is our topic, is Benjamin Wadsworth. So thanks for uh, joining us, Ben. And Betty? Yeah. So uh, we're going to be talking about office moves. Now, this is a subject that we get a lot of questions on, uh, right, Betty? Oh, don't forget to unmute yourself. And there we go. There we go. Second time's a charm. It works. <laughs> we we do get a lot of questions about this. So I'm sorry if this information isn't new to you or you feel it's a uh, been around a while, but this presentation is best based on the questions we get from our customers or after a move, they tell us they wish they would have thought of asking these questions. So we've, uh, we hope it'll be useful for you. Yeah. And of course the pandemic kind of makes all of that, uh, kind of topsy turvy on how that works. And, and that's exactly what we're going to be talking about, uh, those office moves in general. And we're going to touch base on a number of things that you need to think about when it comes to this. Now, let's just start from the very beginning. Ben, when, what would you say is your best advice on where to start when you're thinking about moving an office, uh, either you know, in building or to another location or anything? What would be the very first thing that you would recommend? Sure, and I, I think we have a whole slide on this is don't, don't sign your lease right away. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, that's a, that's a biggie. Um, why, why would you say not to sign a lease right away? So there's, I know that the physical location and the actual budget for a particular location are, are the primary concerns when people are looking for a space to move into. But we do run into several other factors that can cause major problems with an office relocation, and they're commonly overlooked. A lot of those issues have to do with technology. Uh, so that's where I, I, I end up being involved is, um, you know, moving the technology. And a lot of those items surrounding technology aren't really thought of during a move um, when the primary concern is where is the office and how much is it going to cost? Very interesting. Good questions to think about. I mean, many times you would think that these are things that people would think about, but sometimes you get caught up in the the whole moment of moving and there's just so many questions to consider uh, they can they can for easily forget some of the major ones that are very easy to do now i think betty now you mentioned one that uh, you've had some experience with right i have i absolutely have and that is bring your it resources in early um, some people think, oh, IT, okay, yes, when we get ready to talk about a server room or moving computers, but the truth of the matter is they really need to be part of the core decision team from the very beginning, and I think Benjamin can explain why. Yeah, so as I noted, there are a lot of technology issues that are commonly overlooked during a move, and it, you know, in this day and age, uh, for a business, most businesses to operate efficiently, they really do need their technology to operate efficiently also. Um, so, you know, common items overlooked, everything from your basic network cabling, which commonly is not included in a tenant improvement. And a lot of people don't know that. Uh, most landlords do not include network cabling. They expect you to cover that and, and arrange and pay for it um, to telephone and internet service availability. So, Consulting with your technology partner early on helps you avoid all these critical problems after you've already locked in a lease and you're pretty much stuck with what you have. Very interesting. Now, I, I know we kind of talked this in the very beginning, you know, being the pandemic and everything, you would think, well, why would be pe people be thinking about an office move? Uh, some of the topics we had, we had talked about earlier was, well, a lot of people are noticing that they're able to work in a smaller space, being able to work uh, with remote workers has changed things. And uh, on the other side is just trying to cut operating costs is playing into that. So thinking about all those things, bringing in your IT early to talk about what's needed, what's not needed, uh, very, very important. But now, Ben, 
Thanks for that, because that, that's very helpful. And of course, working on the IT side of things, we do find that many a times we're brought in after the, all those things are included. And you're like, well, wait a minute, what about these questions and that? And they didn't think about those things. So that's obviously very important. But now here's something that not everyone really thinks about. I mean, this is 2020, almost 2021. Internet is everywhere. So that's not a consideration, right? You're, you're going to have internet anywhere you work, right, Ben? So that is true that pretty much anywhere you go, you can get internet of some sort. But the, the actual quality and type of that internet service changes by location it can very widely. So you may end up with a location where you can only get very slow, low bandwidth internet. So it's just not going to support um, your business. Uh, or you may end up moving to a location where the only type of service you can get is really expensive, considerably more expensive than what you're paying previously, depending on the location and what you can actually get there. But one of the most common issues that I see overlooked is the time frame it takes to either deploy a new circuit or to relocate an existing internet circuit. A lot of people think, well, this is just, you know, one or two weeks, they can, they, you know, my ISP can move the circuit or I get a new circuit at this location. That's typically not true. It really does depend on which provider you have and what type of service they have at the location. It can take anywhere from one week to deploy to actually several months, depending on the particular situation. So our my general recommendation is that you really have your internet service provider locked in and all those issues figured out at least 45 days before your expected move-in date. Very interesting. And I think that even surprised me working in IT that you really need to talk to them that far in advance. But again, there's a lot of considerations to take into a, a account when doing that. Now, Betty, you and I talked about something else uh, that goes goes right along with uh, using the internet, and that was dealing with phones. Yeah, dealing with phones. I think a lot of people have misconceptions thinking with um, VoIP and our more modern cloud services that it should just be as easy as bringing your phones to your new location and plugging them in. But I think Benjamin's going to share some information that tells us otherwise. Yeah, so, so you hinted at, you know, cloud or hosted phone systems, definitely they're reliant specifically on the internet. So if you have internet at your new location, you're not going to have a problem. You plug them in, your network's up, they get internet, they're up and running. However, if you do have an on-premise phone system, so if you have an actual phone system in your office, that phone system's reliant on, I, I would say, older technology for connection to the wider world. Uh, that could be uh, POTS trunks, could be SIP trunks, it could be a PRI. Uh, you do need to verify what that connection actually is and verify that the ISP at the new location can actually support those types of services because they can't always support every type of service on every type of circuit at any particular location. Very good point. Bandwidth plays a lot into that too because uh, all these different devices you connect in will end up taking a little bit of piece of that pie and then you multiply how many people that are using these and it could be a big issue. Now, one thing we've noticed too is when we go to help uh, an office or a company move into a new office and they've already <laughs> mapped everything out and they bring us in after the fact and they say, okay, we want to move these servers and these computers around. And all of a sudden you find out that uh, they have, you know, these servers they want to move. And now they're in some little obscure or inaccessible area crammed into a corner or more times not into a small closet uh, where there's no ventilation. Uh, I mean, is this a common occurrence or is this just something that we just happen to come across a few times, Ben, when those things aren't thought out? And is that a problem? Yeah, so, so two of the most common issues that cause problems during a move that I have seen are network cabling and, as you mentioned, the server room in general. Um, so there's, there's three main issues I run into on a regular basis. Um, first being the server room is not adequate. It's not large enough to hold the equipment you expect, and it's the right amount of air conditioning or ventilation to keep your, um, to keep your equipment from overheating. Uh, it's not uncommon for people to actually completely forget that they need to have a location to mount their servers. I run into that multiple times. 
Um, a second issue that I commonly come across is that you need to be sure that there's network outlets where you actually need them and in sufficient quantity to support all the devices that you want to plug in. So if you plan to have a desk on, on a particular wall, then you do need to be sure that there's both network and power on that wall, or you may end up running long extension and patch cords across the floor, which is a tripping hazard and looks terrible. And then the third most common problem I run into is the, the type of network cabling. Being sure that the type of network cabling actually supports your network equipment. Uh, so if you intend to use existing cabling in a building, that's something that should be verified that it will support your network equipment. Uh, as a general recommendation, if, if you're doing a new installation, we always recommend that you install category six cabling. Uh, if you are moving into a building or it just in general, category 5E cabling, and I won't get into the technicalities of that, but category 5E cabling is will work in most scenarios. Um, interesting enough, uh, there's actually industry standards that, that address all these issues. It's like a 500 plus page document that addresses everything from server room size to network locations, how many cables should be at each location. But those standards are typically ignored during a tenant improvement. Interesting. I haven't read that. Uh, normally, just for everybody's note, I usually just call Benjamin <laughs> to, to get that information. He's our encyclopedia of, of those uh, those regulations. So uh, that's a lot of information. So you know, when it comes to to you know the old equipment, there's new equipment. You know, uh, what what should we do, Betty? This is something else we talked about. It is. Um, I know during a, a large move that I was involved with uh, in 2008, we carefully made uh, decisions about this for a couple of reasons. Um, users are overwhelmed when they move to a new location. You don't want to throw too many new things at them. But then on the other hand, it's kind of the perfect time, you know, if you plan it around your multifunction device leases and those are close to being up it's kind of the perfect time instead of the expense and the trouble to move your existing copiers and printers to um, have new ones installed i just want to remind everyone if you're going to do that and have new equipment like phone systems also sometimes uh, a good time to move uh, or get new phone systems instead of moving to allow for training and build that into the move. Benjamin, um, what do you see often in this regard? So as you hinted at, uh, phone systems is, is probably when you're, when you're thinking about whether you relocate existing equipment or you buy new equipment, a uh, phone system is probably the one that can make the biggest difference uh, because a, uh, a cloud or hosted phone system, as we mentioned earlier, it's tied to your internet. So it can potentially make a move easier Whereas if you have a um, an on-site phone system, there's other considerations to deal with, like uh, even porting phone numbers, coordinating with your phone vendor, and ensuring that you do have um, you do have phone connection at that location. Interesting. But now, when, when not, many times there can be incentives to do this too, uh, you know, going to a different ISP if your current one. Uh, maybe you're looking to save a little bit of money or you also mentioned with phones or even copiers. Couldn't that also be, you know, a, a good time to think about that or at least investigate because there might be some incentives? Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, so to some degree, um, what ISP you end up with is, is going to be dictated by the actual location you're going to. Um, however, there is a chance when you move that there's going to be more options available to you and you could cut some of your operating expense depending on what you have available. Uh, as long as it supports your existing systems, uh, you, may, you, know, you may go anywhere from a $900 a month bill down to a two three hundred $300 a month bill. Interesting. Well, I mean, the financial incentive is always a good thing it's, uh, to help with the bottom line. But so you go have all these different changes, the things that are going to happen. What other, you know, kind of a kind of a soft or gray area, Betty, could they forget about that is a very, very important, especially for those that are in the legal field? Yes. Well, that's why I'm handling the next two topics, because I remember how much work was involved in notifying everyone it's a whole different ball game if you are a law firm. You have to file a notice of change of address in every matter you're involved in. Every court with the arbitration 
Association. Everybody has to have that updated information. So you receive pleadings and service of process properly. Um, you have to let your clients know. You have to let the state bar know. The post office, the list is long. And that ties right into updating company materials. It's time to, you know, new letterhead, new business cards, new outlook signatures. Uh, just your marketing materials, uh, it goes on and on. So this is the kind of stuff that can be done up front and early once you have your new address, of course. You also need to know if your phone numbers are going to change in any way, shape, or form, which can happen depending on where you're moving. So just a lot to uh, a lot of information to gather and disseminate. Very good. Thank you. That, and many times those things are kind of forgotten until the last minute, and then they're they're scrambling to take care of those things. Yes. Now, I know for most firms, this right here is going to be the biggest question usually comes up from the IT side. How much uh, downtime is involved? You know, many times the moves will start on a Friday afternoon and the goal is to have all the users back in their offices on a, on a Monday morning uh, per whatever regulations are in effect. And downtime, you know, it kind of varies depending on the type of equipment and services that are being moved. Uh, email, obviously, many times email is cloud hosted, so that really doesn't take too much of a hit. But there could be network functionality, uh, remote access to your documents and things of that that will kind of depend on your setup. But Benjamin, what are you seeing in terms of downtime these days and expectations? Sure. So as you mentioned, uh, cloud-based systems, for the most part, don't have a lot of downtime. Uh, if you have hosted email, then your email is still going to come to your smartphone, even though you're relocating. But on-site systems, for example, if you had a local exchange server on-site, or if you have your remote desktop running through an on-site terminal server, those services are going to be down from the moment that everything is powered down at your old location until it's physically moved and your entire network rebuilt at the new location. My Typically what I see is anywhere from two to three hours. Now that's dependent on how far apart these locations are, the difficulty of getting in and out of the buildings, but that's a, that's a good rule of thumb, two to three hours expected downtime uh, for us to be able to relocate equipment and get it at least minimally functional on the internet uh, and up and running for you. Now phone systems are a little different issue. so. As we mentioned before, cloud phone systems, they're internet based, so you're not going to actually take your phone system completely down when you relocate. Uh, so there are ways to mitigate uh, phone system downtime during a move if you're cloud based. You could do things like forwarding to a cell phone, using mobile applications to keep your phones up and running as you relocate. If you have a premise phone system, it's a very different story. And I would say this is probably what takes the most coordination if you are relocating a uh, premise-based phone system. Uh, that is dependent on your internet service provider and whether they're just relocating a circuit or if you're getting a new circuit. If you're getting a new circuit, it's likely you're gonna have to port phone numbers. Uh, that porting process could take up to 30 days or even longer to, to achieve. And then that all has to be coordinated with uh, the time that the numbers are going to be ported with your phone vendor to be on site to test it. Um, you know, there's just a lot of issues surrounding premise-based phone systems that do require a lot of forethought and coordination. Very good. That's great information to keep to keep in mind when doing that. And of course, all kind of depending, the downtime may also uh, depend on any type of regulations or restrictions that are put in, in place uh, because of the pandemic or orders from government agencies. But I guess the, guess the, the next question usually comes up is who is actually going to be moving the computers and equipment? Are the movers moving the computers? Is your IT team or your provider moving the computers? Uh, you have printers, you have copiers that are usually uh, have to be included in that. Who's moving those? Uh, who's going to manage uh, that? Is that the uh, your IT team? Is it the movers? Is it the printer copier company? Uh, so you have to make sure to coordinate that far in advance. Uh, sometimes there are restrictions on who can move certain types of equipment. 
Uh, your movers may not move the computer equipment or may not have factored that into their move to take care of those things. So be careful about that and plan for that far in advance. Uh, another thing to keep, a, keep in mind is when you do actually move things, uh, movers don't usually disconnect and reconnect devices. So who's going to be responsible for doing that? Uh, again, think about who's going to do that and talk to them ahead of time and have that set aside. How are you going to keep things together? Using uh, maybe uh, large plastic bags for each user to put all of their things in and tie it up and have their name on it and office location of where it came from and where it's going to have the, uh, you know, things moved and not lost. That's a, that's a great tool that a lot of people use. Uh, this picture here is a, kind of a great idea of how it, a lot of times movers will take care of things. Uh, they'll provide uh, moving carts where you can load the equipment and then they'll actually move it and then you can uh, put it back in its next location. But there's more to it. Uh, Betty, right? You had mentioned about uh, taking more than just plastic bags. Absolutely. One of the things that made um, the big move I was involved in in 2008 so successful is that we took photos of each office and how they had everything set up in their old location. We also gave them a diagram of their new office and had them draw where they wanted the furniture placed and had them write instructions on if they wanted their computer on top of their desk, under their desk, you know, um, which arm of the desk, et cetera, et cetera. It really, really helped make the move successful and it really eliminated a lot of removing. And I know Benjamin's seen that happen. And so that to me is a simple way to assure you're, you're going to be heading in the right direction when people come into their new office and things are set up the way they hope they would be. Uh, the other thing right. you have to remember um, about moving is ergonomic considerations. So if you've been working with somebody to make sure everybody has an ergonomic workspace, those same improvements need to be done at the new office. And, you know, lots of, it's a lot of work. So that is another layer that needs to be written down. So if you have a keyboard tray that comes out from under your desk, that has to be disassembled and reassembled. And now with um, the pandemic, there's all sorts of considerations to consider about keeping things clean, and I think, Joe, you're going to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, you know, COVID does kind of affect things a little bit. Uh, well, a little bit, a lot in, in how it uh, is going to dictate, you know, the, the amount of time and things that take course in, in, that, in that way. I was thinking, too, uh, Ben, when, when we do office moves or we ha are involved with office moves, do you find when you get into a new location and they get their furniture in that location, are there things that they have not thought about um, once they get the furniture in that location that happen? Uh, so at times I've, I've actually seen uh, furniture move from an old location to a new location and the furniture doesn't fit in the room. Uh, so those are <laughs> things to consider, uh, wow. you know, prior to relocating furniture. Uh, I've seen people put a desk on a wall that doesn't have power or network on it. So that that's an issue. Typically, you can find some way to get power and network to it, but it's not going to be pretty. Um, those are all, you know, fairly common, you know, good coordination, uh, drawings done ahead of time, measurements all taken ahead of time and put, put on uh, floor plan drawings and furniture drawings. All those things help mitigate those kind of problems. Right. Because I mean, it, it never fails that we'll get into an office and the desk is on the opposite side room of where the network jack and the power is at. Yeah. And you end up having to have like a 30 foot cord to go over to the other side of the wall. <laughs> yeah. I, and, and, then the, and then the fire uh, department will come through with the marshal and, you know, ding you for that because that is not safe. So right. uh, that reminds me of one other thing, Benjamin. Um, once you get everything moved over, what do you see um, as normal protocol for confirming connected properly? So when workers do come back into the office, they can assume that their phone will pick up and have a dial tone, that when they sit down at their desk and log in, everything's going to work. How does that work? Yeah, so, so you can, you know, if it'd be exceedingly thorough and log into every single workstation and make sure that every one of them works, uh, you know, it has network connectivity, has email and all that. 
I, I find that typically checking every workstation just to make sure it has network connectivity and then spot checking a few to make sure that you have all, all the access you need to whatever particular uh, services or servers you're using, making sure your email flows, and then picking up your phone system and making a phone call and making sure that you, you one, that the call completes, and two, that you actually have audio in two directions. It's possible, depending on the type of service, if you're cloud-based phones, that there's a firewall issue on your new ISP circuit that can prevent audio from traveling in one direction. That's a really common issue. Uh, so just you checking those bases and spot checking the workstations, I find is sufficient. Excellent. Awesome. Good points. Good things to remember. Now, we had talked about COVID and how that affects things. Obviously, uh, you know, it's not the most ideal time to be moving, but it can be done. Uh, changes in orders from the state government are obviously going to continue to dictate what we can and cannot do in terms of office moves, depending on where you are. So always confirm that your plan move doesn't violate a shelter in place order. Uh, also make sure uh, even further in advance for your services like moving companies and um, other staff that, you know, or technicians that might need to be on site about uh, what time and social distancing they may need for their workers. And just, just remember that everything will take a little bit longer and in, in adhering to those guidelines to maintain uh, the social distancing and to keep everybody safe. And, you know, while we're always looking to sharpen our pencils when it comes to, to moving, uh, during the pandemic, it's recommended that you try not to save money on salvaging packing supplies or reusing them because of what's going on. So your office move coordinator, or if you don't have one, uh, we would really recommend uh, using one. Uh, we'll want to buy new but not used office supplies uh, for doing your move. Um, in certain areas, you can even rent clean plastic totes for packing. Uh, you see the example here where they've been sanitized and cleaned, so that way you know that uh, everything is going to be uh, okay. Uh, take care to ensure that your boxes and other packing materials are clean, not contaminated from some source or uh, someone. And then, of course, upon arrival at your new location. And then just conduct due diligence to ensure that your, your vendors are following the CDC standards. Um, you research and train your staff on best, pra best uh, packing practices. That was a tongue twister, Betty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, um, you know, it, just again, making sure that everyone is staying safe when they're packing things up uh, in the office, uh, when they're unpacking things. And you know, we always find that it's good to provide a, a checklist uh, for, you know, the different teams or whoever is going to be packing things up. That way nothing's left behind and uh, you have a checklist to make sure to remind you of that. And then just arrange for a good deep cleaning before packing, uh, before the movers arrive, and then after the movers arrive uh, to maintain that level of cleanliness. And then again, uh, creating a clean a cleaning checklist for your new space because you probably had one for your old one. So have one ready for your new one, uh, both before and after the move, then confirming responsibility on who's going to be maintaining that and cleaning space uh, you're leaving behind and you're going to. And then just constantly maintain that, uh, that same pattern and follow the precautions. That way everybody stays safe. Now, Betty, that's a lot of stuff. We've talked about a lot of things. Ben, we've <laughs> talked about a lot of things. What do we, we have, have for our what do we have for our listeners today <laughs> to uh, <laughs> walk away with? Well, I've put together a checklist that just kind of goes over the broad areas and and the stuff that's most important in my mind. So anyone who signed up for the presentation will get a PDF copy and it's just a jumping off point. It's certainly not the end all be all, but there's some of this stuff, if you've never been involved in a large office move that you just don't think of. So I um, just wanted to throw some of the things in that I know were important when I was involved in that project. Fantastic. I mean, I know when we were going through all these things, there's a lot of things that come through in the details of an office move and obviously uh, each location and each company that's involved in this, it, it's going to be unique to their situation. But we hope this checklist will help provide you with some reminders on what to do. Make sure to ask questions. And it may be you asked a question and you got it all taken care of, but at least it was asked. You've spent time thinking about it. Because ultimately, 
you know, whether we're out of this pandemic in six months or 12 months, an office move for most companies is going to happen at some point. So we want you to be successful at it. We want it to be uh, as frustration free as possible. So we hope that these reminders and this takeaway will be beneficial to you. And as always, if you ever have any questions or need some information about how to handle or organize a office move, we would be more than happy to assist you with that and answer your questions. Uh, you can send those to info at terrapintechnology.com. Now we have, a, we have a little bit of time left over. So if anyone has any questions, we'll leave the chat window open and uh, respond to those. If not, if you don't have any and you'll be taking off, we hope you have a good afternoon and we thank you for attending. Yes, thank you for sure.